old age home with all the amenities and a medical center with his own resources. His hands-on working nature made him an instant success in every endeavor he initiated in his life. He started off his career with the Usha company and had experience with the India's defense establishment in the department of chief inspectorate of defense vehicles, then moved on to HAL, which had the MIG factory. He learned the Russian language in order to translate the Russian machine manuals and train the personnel of HAL. He worked in the electronic division as an aeronautical engineer. Nanagaru corresponded with our Honorable President APJ Abdul Kalam when our country's president was with the Bangalore HAL. Jagan Mohan Rao Garu was selected by the government initiative of encouraging entrepreneurs. He took the opportunity and started Sri Venkateswara Automic Industries which supplied tools to the APS RTC. He ran his industries successfully for 20 years and leased out as his next generation took on to the software industry. After retiring, he was initiated into social service by Chakradhar Yermeni, his second son, through the famous Rusha Mani Foundation, named after my grandmother. Now, Jagan Mohan Rao Garu and his life partner, Vijay Lakshmi, practically are taking care of the economically backward merit students and giving them a nourishing environment to study and take up medicine, engineering, accountancy, and prodding them to take up Indian civil services exams. These children would have dropped out of school for the lack of funds to study further, but thanks to his better half, my mother, Y. V. J. Lakshmi, and Jagan Mohan Rao Garu, and my brother, Chakradar, Rushamani Foundation children are taking on to bright futures. Yerneni Jagan Mohan Rao Garu has been featured in the newspapers for his intensive social service activity, honored by the Rotary Club, for extending help financially and logistically. When the state was devastated in floods, he's appreciated by Maduranagar Welfare Association many times for financial help, advice, and assistance. He's mentioned by many grateful parents for, for the foundation's valuable handholding through the admissions and financial support. He's honored by the governor and the chief minister of the state and the Prema hospitals with appreciation certificates. His discipline, sportive spirit, keenness to be healthy, and most of all, the yearning to help with his resources, to give away selflessly without a second thought when a need is felt are awe-inspiring features of his personality. Though he has a trail of accolade, he keeps himself low profile and remains humble. I'd like to quote a few lines of H.W. Longfellow, which suit my father's way of life. <clears throat> life is real. Life is earnest. Into each life, some rain must fall. Let us then be up and doing with a heart for any fate still achieving, still pursuing. Learn to labor and to wait. May he continue to do the good work and may he stay healthy and happy always. Thank you. Thank you, Usha, for giving us a glimpse of your dad's life and work. It was very well said. Uh, he, Mr. Jagan Mohan Rao's son, Chakradar, also is with us. I don't know if his camera is switched on, but... Uh, he stays in the U.S., but he's currently here. Glad that both of you are here. Thank you. Uh, every meeting, as I said, is an endowment lecture, and it is also supported by another logistic sponsorship. And this month's meeting has been is about a lady, an amazing lady whom I had the fortune and privilege of knowing. She passed away last year at the ripe age of 101. And uh, not only us, our kids also have known her from the practically from the time they were born. And to tell us about Mrs. Yu Manorama Rao, we have her granddaughter, Rekha Rao. Rekha? Thank you so much, Subhu. 
A very good evening, everybody, and happy Sankranti. It gives me great joy and pride this evening to introduce my paternal grandmother, the late Srimati Yu Manorama Rao, at this 157th monthly meeting of Foswell, Hyderabad. Born in Madras on October 8, 1917, into a progressive and culturally inclined Chitrapur Saraswat Konkani family that encouraged education and goals. My grandmother Manorama was the eldest of three daughters. Her father, Tombat Anand Rao, was a lawyer by profession, and Kamla Devi Tombat, my great grandmother, was a strong and determined lady who went on to do her Visharad in Hindi after marriage. She learned Hindustani classical music and subsequently became a professor of Hindi and Sanskrit at Queen Mary's College in Madras, which was one of the first three colleges for women in the country. My grandmother, whom we grandkids affectionately called Papama or father's Amma, not only had an uncanny physical resemblance to my great grandmother, but she also inherited her many talents and zest for life. Following her early schooling at CSI Ewart School and Presidency Training School in Madras, where my grandmother's classmates included the likes of Lakshmi Sehgal and Rani of Travancore, my grandmother joined Queen Mary's College in 1934, where she topped the entire Madras Presidency. At that time, Presidency comprised of all the four southern states. So she topped the entire Madras Presidency in English for which she was awarded the Krupabai Satyanathan Gold Medal for proficiency in English language. She then joined the BA Honours course in English Language and Literature at Presidency College, another British-era institution overlooking the Marina Beach and the expansive waters of the Bay of Bengal. A keen and passionate student with a special love for English, my grandmother studied everything from Old English to the Romantics, to Shakespeare, and topped off her course with yet another gold medal, the Grigg Memorial Gold Medal at university level. Being British Times, she told me that many of her professors were from and educated at Oxford and Cambridge. It was the beginning of a lifelong love for literature. She was a voracious reader who inculcated the reading habit in not only her children, but in her grandchildren as well, and a lady who wrote the most detailed and descriptive letters, which serve as a chronicle of her life and the times. In 1939, she met my grandfather, Udyavar Narayan Rao, a young England returned barrister from the Middle Temple, who came back to India and joined the Madras High Court as an advocate. The two married in 1940 and beautifully complemented each other in every way. She was gregarious, charming, intellectual, while he was a highly principled gentleman of few words, but much respected in his professional and personal circles. They went on to have three children, my father Ravi, Aunt Geeta, and Uncle Ranjit. Coming from an enlightened family, my grandmother ensured that all three of her children got the best of education. Even as she and my grandfather traveled from one posting to another in his capacity as district judge, the education of their children was never compromised on. My father studied at Madras Christian School and College, completed his PhD in biochemistry from the Indian Institute of Science, and went on to have a successful career in the pharmaceutical industry. My aunt Gita joined Wooster Polytechnic in the late 1960s, and went on to become one of the earliest women of her generation to get an MD PhD. And she's a renowned heart transplant expert and cardiologist in the US. Meanwhile, my uncle Ranjit joined the Indian Air Force after training at RIMC Dehradun and NDA and finally retired as a wing commander. Life dealt my grandmother a rather cruel blow in 1965 when my grandfather passed away prematurely at age 54 while still in service of the government of Karnataka. However, showing tremendous grace and strength of character, she gathered the pieces of her life together and went on to lead a long and fulfilling life, one that was filled with family, 
friends, and varied experiences. She gave versatility and the term multifaceted a whole new meaning. Her travels took her across the length and breadth of India and abroad, from Kashmir to Kanyakumari, from Assam to Madurai, from Sweden and Rome to the US and Canada. Her last trip out, a family holiday that we did to Cochin and Kumarukum, was in 2015 when she was clocking 98 years. In her lifetime, she had the privilege of listening to greats like Rabindranath Tagore and Sarojini Naidu, and even meeting St. Teresa of Calcutta. Papama was an extraordinary conversationalist and a hostess with a wide variety of interests. From sewing quilts and knitting sweaters to whipping up culinary delights, from playing badminton, caroms, chess, and card games to the tabla and violin, from reading everything from National Geographic to Chaucer, from being an avid gardener and bird watcher to a lover of pets and kids, from a devoted daughter, wife, mother, grandmother, and great-grandmother to being a citizen of the world, she did it all. A powerhouse of positivity and optimism, she loved people and was gifted at having conversations with them, no matter their age or size. She could recite Sanskrit shlokas and sing devotional bhajans from memory right into her very senior years. And she was fluent in as many as seven or eight languages. Her bookkeeping and handicrafts are a testament to her meticulousness and creativity, while her coin and stamp collection are really a collector's delight. Equally fascinating is the fact that she lived through some of the most uh, greatest events and milestones of modern human history the two world wars, the Great Depression, the Indian independence movement, the turn of the century or Y2K in 2000, and the digital age. While all these special qualities and skills kept her young at heart, a combination of genes, disciplined lifestyle, indomitable spirit, and the care and company of loved ones can all probably be attributed to her longevity. After maintaining an independent lifestyle and home in Bangalore till age 88, Papama moved to Hyderabad to stay with my parents, with whom she remained till she passed away of natural causes at age 102 in April of last year. We celebrated the momentous milestone of her 100th birthday on October 8, 2017 with great fanfare amidst loving family and friends from near and afar. My grandmother lived a long, fruitful, and more importantly, a good and healthy life. A grand old dame with a love for life and a zest, and a never say die spirit, she remains alive in our hearts and memories. And her rich legacy is a reminder of just how much we all can do in the lifetime that is given to each one of us. Thank you so much. Thank you, Reka, as usual. You're eloquent, very well said. Thank Papama's you. accomplishments were many, so it is no wonder that you would miss a few. She was also an avid photographer. And uh, for a lady to be a photographer in those days was not common. And she was a fierce nationalist, very patriotic person. And she would often debate with her son, Ravi Rao, being on the opposite side and I would be with her. Great memories. Well, people become great by the way they live their lives. And I think today evening we are seeing in life and blood another guy who will be remembered very fondly in ages to come. And I'm referring to our distinguished speaker for today, Dr. Nageshwar Reddy. He has put not just Hyderabad, but India on the world healthcare map like very few have done. His passion, his devotion, and his dedication to his specialty, medicine in general, and to gastroenterology, and to make it a mainstream, recognizable specialty in the healthcare is unparalleled. And so it is said, not by me, but by multiple countries in all continents, as you would uh, soon hear when Dr. Sravya Tipirneni will tell us about Dr. Nageshwaredi. 
chairman of AIG. Dr. Stravia. Thank you so much. It is an honor indeed to introduce a stalwart, not just in his field of medicine, but in the field of healthcare. Dr. Nageshwar Reddy, in fact, needs no introduction whatsoever. His institutions speak for themselves. As a doctor myself, it's truly inspiring to see the sheer hard work and dedication that Dr. Nageshwar Reddy has put in to Asian Institute of Gastroenterology and the levels and standards that it has scaled up to. The effort and the perfection can be seen at every stage when you enter these institutions and hospitals. The culture inculcated in each person who works for this hospital speaks for itself. I will try my best to highlight Dr. Reddy's numerous achievements and recognitions in a concise manner, but let me tell you, it was a very daunting task to make the summary brief, given the sheer numbers of awards, papers, publications, and award um, recognitions that Dr. Reddy has been conferred with since his medical school. Dr. D. Nageshwar Reddy is currently the chairman of the Asian Institute of Gastroenterology, that is AIG Hospitals in Hyderabad. He is also the past president of the World Endoscopy Organization. Um, he started his journey by graduating from Karnul Medical College, obtaining internal medicine masters in Madras Medical College and DM in gastroenterology from PGI Chandigarh. He subsequently worked as a professor of gastroenterology in Andhra Pradesh Health Sciences before setting up AIG, which is a tertiary care gastrointestinal specialties hospital. He had won almost all the possible gold medals during his MBBS days, including the Phillips Blue Ribbon for the outstanding student in MBBS. He has numerous awards and recognition towards his contribution to gastroenterology. Some of them I am going to highlight here. In 1991, he had won the Japanese Endoscopy Research Foundation Award. 1995, Dr. Reddy was conferred with the Dr. B.C. Roy Award for the Development of Specialities, the highest medical award in the country given by the Indian Medical Council. In 1996, the Vidya Ratan Award for Outstanding Gastrointestinal Services to the Community, also received the Andhra Pradesh Academy of Science Award for Outstanding Medical Scientist. In 2002, he received the Padma Shri, one of the highest civilian awards given by the government of India. In 2009, a Master Endoscopist Award given by the American Society of GI Endoscopy, in 2011, he was conferred the International Service Award by the American Society of Gastroenterology. He received the Padma Bhushan Award from the Government of India in 2016. Dr. Nageshwar Reddy's main area of research interest has been in GI endoscopy, particularly in therapeutic pancreatobiliary endoscopy and innovations in transgas transgastric endoscopic surgery. He has published over 670 papers in national and international peer review journals and has contribute chap contributed chapters in more than 20 international textbooks of gastroenterology. He has also edited eight GI endoscopy textbooks and is on the editorial board of many noteworthy medical journals, including the Lancet and World Journal of Gastroenterology, just to name a few. He has been a visiting faculty for over 200 international endoscopy workshops and is also a forum member of the Asian Endoscopy Masters Forum. He has been recognized for all his achievements by several societies internationally and nationally. He has been elected as an honorary member for the American Society of GI Endoscopy in 2004. He is a fellow of the National Academy of Medical Sciences, New Delhi, and also a fellow of the Philippine Society of Gastroenterology. 
He has given several named orations, including the Francisco Roman Oration of the Philippine Society in and Los Angeles in 2007. He also did do the Sir Francis Avery Jones Professorship in St. Mark's, London, 2008. Dr. Nageshwar Reddy received the Master Endoscopist Award in 2009, an International Leadership Award in 2011, and is also a fellow of the ACG in 2012. He received the highest award master of World Gastroenterology Organization from, in, from the World Gastroenterology Organization in 2014. In 2015, he received honorary fellowship and lifetime memberships from multiple societies internationally. All that I have mentioned is not even half of Dr. Reddy's list of recognitions and contributions. It is a great honor, ladies and gentlemen, and boys and girls, to present to you Dr. Nageshwar Reddy, sir. Thank you so much, sir, for making time for this event. We all know how packed your schedule is, and we appreciate your time immensely. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Servia, uh, for trying to make it as short as possible. On a personal note, I should uh, welcome some more of you guys from HPS, Begum Pate, and Raman Tapur who have joined us. I'm sure uh, Nagi's name is the draw. We also have several doctors. Uh, I can see Dr. Anand Apkari, Dr. Arora, and some doctor, Dr. Aishwarya Rajiv, and several of you, welcome. Uh, I think I could not name you when you joined late. Uh, on a personal note, the reason I mentioned this is because uh, Dr. Nageshwaridi and several of us on this call uh, went to the same school and we were classmates, I think from eighth class when we branched out into different uh, specialties. Jayant also has joined us, Nagi. Jayant Sate. Yes. So with that, uh, I invite Dr. Nageshwaridi to deliver today's endowment lecture on... Um, New Practices in Medicine and a New Virus in the New Year. The floor is yours, Dr. Nagesh Reddy. Thank you, Subbarao. At the outset, uh, I'm extremely grateful to you for giving me this opportunity. And looking at the previous list of speakers, I'm also humbled that I've been asked to do this job. I'd like to thank Dr. Shavya also for this uh, introduction. And also, many public school classmates were there out there who have been, of course, we made the journey in the school earlier, and now we are in different walks of life. So when uh, Subarao asked me to talk on this subject, I realized that there are many non-doctors here, so it should be a subject which is not for doctors, but for, in general, for everybody. And one of the topics I didn't want to talk on was COVID for two reasons. First was, of course, that the last meeting you had an excellent speaker in form of Dr. Matthew Burgess, who's uh, an expert and a fantastic speaker in this area, and he's already talked to the same forum. And the second reason was, of course, that I think all of you are getting bombarded with so many of these uh, COVID programs in social media and TVs and so on. So I decided that I should do something different. So I started with new practices in medicine, but something changed. In the first week of January, I think this third wave came. We never thought it will come in such a big way. The third wave came. And therefore, I had to again change my topic to this new practices in medicine and new virus, new year. What I'm going to talk over the next few minutes is going to divide it into three parts. This very new phenomena that's occurring in the field of uh, COVID. The new advances that are occurring in medicine. And finally, I think the art of medicine, which is very important, which uh, even doctors tend to forget now. So it's going to be of medicine, mice, robotics, and artificial intelligence. Uh, now, this was a very famous uh, painting that used to be hung in the microbiology department in our college. Uh, 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 would you like to share your screen? Now? We are it's... sharing the screen. Uh, we are able to see your screen, but it is not shared on Zoom. There is a share screen huh? button at the bottom. Uh, you have to spotlight the host. Okay, let me do that. 
host has to spotlight our video and then you will get it okay got it sorry go ahead you got it now yes okay yes go ahead okay, okay. so this was a very famous painting in the microbiology department in our middle college which used to be called the plague and as medical students will look at this this was uh, the black death which killed the largest number of people ever in the world 200 million people were killed and this was predominantly between 1350 to 1400 we should look at this painting and think how ignorant people were then that this was obviously a bacteria called st ersenia which caused this the bubonic plague death occurred and we thought why didn't people recognize this so obvious death went across cities people died and pope at that time was saved because he sat between two large fires so that he was protected from this this was in 1357 and in 2019 2020 2021 the advent of the corona virus has put us in the same league we are almost uh, like what we were thinking plague was in 1350 now it's with corona in fact we look back at the ignorance now that was a bacteria we knew all about it a little later and now of course not a problem because we have antibiotics and this was a small rna virus which um, was so small in nanometer it didn't have any intelligence it just had an rna particle and that is running through countries it's running through people it's killing uh, not only large number of people but frightening the presidents, prime ministers, everybody seems to catch it. Just to highlight in that, although we made dramatic progress in medicine, we still have to be humble to nature. It's nature which controls us and we have to be, I think, acknowledge the fact that at any point in history, now or in the future, nature can actually mold us to what the way it wants. So we are actually not the supreme beings, but it's the nature which controls us. And this is a very clear picture we get from this. Now, what happened with uh, the new COVID was that we thought everything disappeared. And this is quite obvious, you can see here. We had the first fall wave which came in India in 2020 August. And then came the second wave. And you can see the second wave was the Delta wave, which was fairly significant. And I was thinking that by December of this year, actually, when Subarao talked to me, I thought, okay, we, all, uh, we can forget about it and think about other things. We get, got better, better, better. And then suddenly in the January first week, we had the sudden spike of cases. And just today, we have had 2.5 lakh cases of uh, COVID now amongst us. So this came back again. The new COVID or the third wave actually was first discovered uh, for the fourth wave for them in South Africa by Dr. Coetzee, who was uh, actually a South African um, you know, medical society's president, who noticed that in their region, they had uh, suddenly noticed a cluster of waves. So it was actually very interesting. This was actually a technician who noticed this. He found that um, suddenly they were getting to the lab a group of samples which showed that this was a COVID, but there was an absence of a specific antigen called S antigen. He informed Dr. Coetzee, who sent this for genomic analysis, and they found that this was a huge mutation in the old virus, giving rise to this Omicron, the new virus. Uh, these viruses are lab, uh, labeled after Greek words, so they get, they get complicated as we go on. So Omicron was the latest virus that uh, came in, and because of large number of mutations that were present. Now, as you can see here, the Delta virus had some mutations, but the Omicron had over 50 mutations and majority of them were in the spike protein. 32 of them were in the spike protein and spike protein is the area where the virus goes and gets attached to the receptors in the human body and then enters in the throat, in the lungs and so on. So because of this mutation in the spike protein, it was getting attached better to the ACE receptors. But also more importantly, because of all our immunity, the vaccines and natural immunity was directed against the old spike protein, this new spike protein virus could escape this. So almost everybody got reinfected, whether they're vaccinated, not vaccinated, and so on. 
everybody got reinfected. Little difference, I'll come to that later, but everybody got reinfected. So this Omicron created this third wave, which we thought would not occur, but eventually came to us. This is because of the large number of mutations that occurred in the spike protein. So the whole world was engulfed with this Omicron. So this first South Africa, you can see, then England, then Scotland, Denmark, US, and now, of course, we're seeing this wave in India, and it's believed that this virus is going is so infectious that the whole population eventually gets infected. But there are some silver linings to this virus also. And you can see this by quite clearly here, that the first silver lining is this, that in South Africa, although the case numbers you can see are very high, the admissions in the hospital were very low. And of course, the deaths were extremely low. This was the first silver lining, which means that this virus, although it's very, very infectious, for some reason is not causing a major serious illness like the previous Delta virus. Now, the, one of the reasons, of course, there's a lot of work. I, again, as predominantly it's done, doctors who are watching this, I won't, don't want to go into the details, but one of the reasons is this virus gets confined mainly to the throat, the upper part of the respiratory tract. It's not going down into the lungs like the previous virus, and then therefore not producing all these systemic reactions and so on. The, the bottom line is that this is a very low death rate that we're seeing with this virus, but the infectious nature. The other interesting thing is this phenomena that is occurring. This is occurring in Netherlands, and you can see this, there's a crisscross. That is, the purple line is actually the Omicron virus which is increasing, and the green line is the Delta virus which is decreasing. So there's a crossover that's occurring. In India, at this point, we're somewhere here, but many of the countries are going there. So what is happening is your population is being replaced by Omicron rather than Delta. And this is very important because once Omicron comes in, it replaces Delta, which was more serious. So now you're getting a milder infection. And second most important thing is, we have noticed that the immunity that Omicron produces, the antibodies that Omicron produces, protects against Delta. So we're in fact getting a natural vaccine. Of course, we don't want to call this for controversies, but it's sort of a nature's vaccine. So nature has been telling us, you guys are doing so many vaccines, unfortunately is not so effective. Let me give you the best vaccine. And the best vaccine is this that we are starting to get this. Of course, in India, I think one of the uh, positive signs was that we've had our own vaccines, the Covaxin, the Covishield, and of course, the other ones are coming in now, the Corbe vaccine from biological events and so on. All these vaccines, different kinds of vaccines are giving us protection. The first vaccines were given in 2021. And then, of course, uh, now we are starting to get this booster dose uh, for some reason, the government wants us to call this precautionary dose, which is given as a third dose, which definitely protects against all variants of this virus. In fact, there is evidence that if you have taken a vaccine in some people by nine months and in some others, especially those above age of 60 years or those who have diabetes and so on, by six months, the antibody levels are coming down. And you can see this very clearly, the antibody levels come down. And for this reason, you have to take a booster dose between six to nine months to enhance your immunity again. And there is definite evidence that whatever the variant, even Omicron, you're protected against, if you take three shots. For example, if you take two shots, you're partly protected. If you take three shots, you're more protected. And more importantly, if you have had a natural infection previously and taken the vaccine, you also have large amount of T cells as immunity you're almost uh, uh, very well protected. Now, in spite of that, you'll see now that everybody who's had a previous infection also, some of them had vaccines are developing this Omicron infection. What is happening is it's coming in as a very, very mild flu-like illness and going off. Sometimes you're just carrying the virus. In fact, if you test many normal asymptomatic people, they're still positive for this Omicron. We have a special way of testing it. You're still positive for Omicron, but no illness. You're carrying the virus for three, four days and the virus goes off then. So this is what we are finding now. Another very important observation is this. This is in Portugal. In Portugal, almost 100% of the population have been vaccinated. And you see what happens. 
that even if they are vaccinated, you tend to still get the disease, as you can see here. You get the disease, but look at the deaths. Deaths are absolutely gone. There's no deaths at all. So if the country gets fully vaccinated, you may still get an infection, but this disease becomes a small cold-like illness and goes off again. And of course, in addition, there's a golden lining also, in addition to, so look at the, what happened in South Africa now. Again, very obvious, as you can see here, that we started with uh, the regular native virus. It became the beta virus. Then it became the Delta virus and now the Omicron virus. But look at the peaks. You see what happens in the peaks. You see that the Delta virus was actually staying for a few months. Whereas the Omicron virus is now went up and has come down quickly. Within four weeks, the virus has dramatically reduced in incidence. And this is being seen now in UK. UK, already the decline has started. So what is predicted is, I know Sheshu also is here, he's an epidemiologist. So what is predicted here is that the new wave or the third wave that you're seeing with this Omicron virus is going to rapidly drop. So somewhere end of this year month or middle of next month, all the, uh, the extent of the disease that we have in the population is going to come down and most people are going to become immune. So this is a prediction. And then sometimes, of course, like the weatherman's prediction, these predictions uh, in epidemiology may not always come true, but to a large extent, it looks like the pattern that's happening in South Africa now, in UK now, seems to be that you're going to have a dramatic drop in this uh, uh, virus that's going to occur because of the pattern of this virus. Now, you may ask me, you're a gastroenterologist and you're, you're running a hospital. Uh, why, why are you talking about, what do you know about uh, Omicron? Of course, the reason why, of course, is that at AG, we have a very large team of people very interested. And the recent data you can see here that Omicron is replacing the regular uh, variants. When we do analysis, we have a very high-end uh, lab, microbiology lab. Which we also have genomic analysis and so on. And you can see very clearly that right now it's 70% Omicron. And we believe in the next two weeks, it's going to be 90%. Three weeks, 100% is going to be Omicron. And you can see that at AAG, we've been very interested in this again for a very long time. Uh, we probably have one of the largest experience in the world treating patients with COVID, 25,000 patients, 2,000 of them in the Delta period when they were ventilated. And now this need for ventilation has dramatically dropped. We have experienced with um, over 150,000 RT-PCR tests. And we are, of course, the largest experience with monoclonal antibodies uh, in the world and one of the lowest mortality rates. And of course, we encourage vaccine production, uh, vaccines to all the people. So I think um, all in all, our team here has got a huge experience. And that's the reason why we believe that it's our social responsibility also, not only to talk about this, but also see that effective measures are taken in public to decrease this. But let me come to this uh, very interesting, uh, um, how the mouse actually saved us from this disease. If you go back to plague, it was the fleas from the rodent which spread the disease. And uh, the rodents destroyed human beings. And it has, in fact, must have heard about the so many stories how, because London got completely burnt, all the rodents were destroyed, and that's how the plague went off. But here is the reverse the mouse actually saved us. You know how? The Delta virus in South Africa, it's believed, actually entered into a mouse. And in the mice of the last one year, it's been undergoing repeated uh, replications and mutations of the virus. So that these 32 mutations that have occurred in the Omicron, from Delta to Omicron, you can see the change occurred because these uh, mutations were favorable for the mice. And at one stage, Omicron, which had, had these mutations, was also getting very easily infected into human beings, but not producing such severe disease. And even in the mice, it doesn't produce severe disease. So it's because of these mutations that occurred in the mice that the human race probably is saved from total destruction. Otherwise, just imagine if we had an Omicron-like infectivity with the Delta-like pathogenicity, we would be, I mean, we would be in a disastrous state now. But this didn't happen, and again, we have to be thankful to nature and to the simple mice for help to saving humanity.
Now let's change track and come to another area uh, to show advances. All these times I've been talking about the power of nature and I think um, the lack of uh, power that as science has, but then this is one area, but there's been also certain areas where science is taking over and this is something that happened recently. In the University of Maryland, uh, in January 11th, there was a heart transplant, a very unusual type of heart transplant, not the standard type. Heart from a pig was transplanted to a human being who was, of course, had a terminal cardiac problem. Now, what was really uh, not only strange, but what was really unique about this was this pig's heart was humanized. That is, normally when you transplant organs from one species to another species, the organ is immediately rejected uh, because of various antigens that are present on this organ. But in this case, to prevent this rejection, what scientists did, they, the basic scientists initially, transplant scientists, was they humanized the heart, changed all the antigens on the heart so that it's more friendly to human beings and heart is transplanted. And now, in the last um, one week, the patient is doing very well. Happened in India long back, 20 years back, but of course, that was all this um, humanization was not done, so the heart was rejected. But right now, this, I believe, is a major, major advance in medicine because if you can do it with heart, you can do it with kidneys, you can do it with liver and so on. And just imagine that in future, you're going to have this law, a lot, a lot of uh, pig farms where these humanized pigs are going to be grown and organs can be housed, harvested because I think uh, there are many, many patients who require uh, um, organs. You don't have enough organs because of course you don't have so many donors right now. Of course, there are other, other animal ethics involved and so on. I don't want to go into the issue, but I think, I believe if you look at Look back at the scientific advances that occurred in during our life period. This would be one of the most important things. And this patient survived for a long time. Then I think uh, this type of transplants are now going to become a common mode. And coming to robotics, I think when you come to robotics and medicine, this is a topic that Subara asked me to talk. All of us imagine robotics this way from the movies that we see. This is, of course, the famous Rajini Khan movie where you have a humanized robotic who seems to do everything that a human being does. As this is a popular concept and many, many patients come and ask me, don't you have a robot to do this? Don't you have a robot to do this? Robots do certainly play a role in uh, medicine. And that's because of the precision. This is a Japanese uh, a swordsman who is so accurate. Whereas his accuracy can be only duplicated by a robot. If, if you ask me to break an apple, that I can't do it, but a robot can. So you can see a robot here can do exactly slice it the way we want without harming the effect. So this is an extreme precision that is required in medicine very often. And this can, of course, uh, you can duplicate the highest human skills very commonly by any number of robotics. And this is the advantage you have. So if you want to do precision surgery, this is going to be very effective. And the second most important thing about robotics is that robots don't get fatigued. You can see here that uh, uh, this was in the MIT lab here. We're trying to make a robot do a, do a action that a human does, a very, very accomplished human who can actually put his uh, knife across in different areas continuously without causing any damage. Now, this cannot be done by everybody. Somebody has to be an expert to do this without causing any harm to the fingers and you can see a robot can do it very easily very safely because of the pressure involved so the two advantages of the robot are the precision and the lack of fatigue so when you're doing long surgeries we find that when the robot is involved in the surgery it never gets fatigued it goes on doing this surgery and that's the reason why uh, robots are going to come into medicine a person can never be broken I just leave it our built very environment video our technologies in are broken and disabled we, the people, need not accept our limitations, but can transcend disability through technological innovation. Indeed, through fundamental advances in bionics in this century, we will set the technological foundation for an enhanced human experience, and we will end disability. I'd like to finish up with one more story, a beautiful story, the story of Adrian Hoslett Davis. Adrian lost her left leg in the Boston terrorist attack. 
I met Adrian when this photo was taken at Spalding Rehabilitation Hospital. Adrian is a dancer, a ballroom dancer. Adrian breathes and lives dance. It is her expression. It is her art form. Naturally, when she lost her limb in the Boston terrorist attack, she wanted to return to the dance floor. Mm -hmm. After meeting her and driving home in my car, I thought, I'm an MIT professor. I have resources. Let's build her a bionic limb to enable her to go back to her life of dance. Brought in uh, MIT scientists with expertise in prosthetics, robotics, machine learning, and biomechanics. And over a 200-day research period, we studied dance. We brought in dancers with biological limbs, and we studied how do they move? What forces do they apply on the dance floor? And we took those data and we put forth fundamental principles of dance, reflexive dance capability, and we embedded that intelligence into the bionic limb. Bionics is not only about making people stronger and faster. Our expression, our humanity can be embedded into electromechanics. Please allow me to introduce Adrienne Hoslett Davis, her first performance since the attack. She's dancing with Christian Leitner. Well, you can see how robotics is transforming all aspects of medicine. You can have these bionic limbs. In fact, if you notice, even the announcer, the doctor had bionic limbs. These bionic limbs are now becoming very common. And in GI practice, in robotic surgeries especially, this is what we have, the Da Vinci system. The surgeon is not with the patient. He's sitting in a console somewhere else and then doing this. And this is the first robotic endoscopy in the world that we did. This was first done at the AIG hospitals. And you can see that I'm actually holding the scope, but the surgeon is far behind the, manipulating the robot. And you can see the tiny arms or the tip of the robot with which we can do. And again, for the non-medical people, the large defect you see here was a tumor that I removed using this technique. It took about 12 minutes to remove this tumor. And you can see that it is healed completely. Whereas if I had to do it in a normal fashion with the endoscopy, it would have taken eight hours. So this is how effective robots have been. And they're replacing uh, many, many areas. Of course, it's going to take some more time. But I think if you look at uh, what some of the pioneers have said in this area, you'll see how wrong they can be. In fact, Thomas Edison said that uh, fooling around with alternate current is a waste of time. Nobody will use it. I mean, totally wrong. Um, Albert Einstein said that the atom would have to be shattered at will. There's not the slightest indication that nuclear energy will ever be obtainable. Again, totally wrong. And Bill Gates in 1981 said 640K ought to be enough for anybody. Even my granddaughter, I think, won't use 640K. It's so small. So progress has dramatically occurred, and especially with the use of artificial intelligence in medicine. This is a whole new topic, so I won't go into the details of the topic. And again, for those who are engineers, this is uh, what they commonly know. But for medical people, it took us some time to know what is artificial intelligence, machine learning, and deep learning. And what we're now using in 2020 is the deep learning that has occurred. For example, if a machine sees an Audi car, how does it recognize an Audi car? It goes through this deep neural network. And finally, the images come as Audi car. And uh, now we're combining artificial intelligence with digital medicine. So digital medicine is another very common thing that's coming. And this is a classic example of a patient in the intensive care unit. And you can see on the top here, he has what is called ventricular fibrillation. And for, again, for the non-doctors here, this is irregular beating of the heart. 
if you continue to have this for more than four minutes, he will develop uh, cardiac asystole death, and of course, flow to the brain, blood, and all will go down. So this has to be corrected. In the intensive care units, all the time the nurses, the doctors are watching. If ventricular fibrillation come, they immediately shock the patient or give a drug to convert this. But now we don't have to worry. We have a computer which is attached to this patient's. Uh, you can see this attached to the who rec which recognizes the ventricular fibrillation, immediately orders a syringe to deliver some drug, and within seconds the patient has gone back to normal rhythm. So all this occurs, and this has again become a common practice now. The use of a combination of artificial intelligence with digital medicine. A simple example, but the more complex ones that are going to happen. And again, in our own specialty, this is what uh, this is Professor Kudo, one of the leading endoscopists in the world. I had an opportunity to work with him. He's got an endoscope called intelligent endoscope or the endobrain. He puts the scope inside and he doesn't have anything. The scope tells you whether this is cancer, not cancer, and probability of what it being. You can see all that's coming in. So this is again something that we are now using regularly in our practice. So that even a junior doctor not experienced can just put in an endoscope and he will know immediately whether they are dealing with a what type of tumor and so on. So all advances that are occurring. And what's going to happen in the near future is this. This is a patient who has uh, like blood vomiting. She doesn't have to rush to the hospital. She takes a pill. She takes a capsule. And this capsule has got a camera and can transmit her images via broadband to the gastroenterologist. And all this technology is available. We have this capsule in our hospital right now, which you can solve and get images. You just have to transmit these images via broadband. So the gastroenterologist, um, this is actually one of my friend, Guido Costa Magna, who's, who likes football a lot. And he's watching a football game. Of course, he doesn't want to go um, uh, to the hospital because that's interesting. This is actually the finals of the World Cup. He's watching this match. But simultaneously, or you look on his TV, he has this uh, screen where the capsule is telling him where the bleed is coming from. So what he does is he uses the same remote as the TV screen, what he uses for the TV screen. Gets out a small injection needle and injects into this area where the bleed is occurring to see and see if he can stop the bleed. Again, these are some things that we can now do technologically very easily. The bleed doesn't stop, so he gets out a small clip Again, coming out of the capsule, uh, and then with this clip, you can go in and actually clip that area which is bleeding. He clips the area, of course, uh, the bleed stops. He's quite happy because he can watch the match. The patient doesn't have to come to the hospital, and uh, of course, um, has next day a recorded version of what happened. This is important because the last goal was scored just at that point of time. So, this you see is advances that already the technology is available, and we're putting it together now. And these are going to actually bring forth certain ethical questions. For the first time in the history, there walks upon this planet a species so powerful that it can control its own evolution, its own time of choosing the hemosphere. The Homo, homo space sapiens can control everything now. But what we should realize is we should be humbled by what happened with the COVID, that nature is still more powerful uh, than us. And whatever new species we create next should not be something that dominates us. Because as we go along, one of the things that's happening in medicine is precision medicine, genomics. In fact, we can now, again, in our hospital, we have this machine. We give a drop of blood. In about um, two or three hours, it can give you the gene sequencing of all your genes. And in two days' time, we can tell you the sequence of your whole body genes. Every gene in your body can be sequenced in just two or three days at a cost of 50, 60,000 rupees. So this is the genomic sequencing. And now what we are doing is that we're practicing precision medicine. And we realize this, that normally what do doctors do if somebody comes with a, a disease or a fever, for example, you give an antibiotic or you give a tablet, say, take it one tablet three times a day or twice a day, that is a standard. But what we found is that every person reacts differently to each tablet. For one person, one is enough for one person. This is because of your genes. Your capacity to metabolize these tablets are different in each person. So we have what is called pharmacogenomics. And at least for six drugs, we have started in this in our hospital that if a patient has to take this drug, we tell him, get your genomics done. You may require only one dose. You don't require 
three doses of this antibiotics. Just get this done. And based on that, we can give a tablet exactly according to that patient's need. This is called precision medicine. And this is going to be common. We already started practicing now, and this is going to be for every single drug. Precision medicine is going to the future of medicine is going to be precision medicine. And finally, let me come to the last part of my talk. I talked to you all about the scientific advances. I talked to you about um, the power and nature, but what is more important than everything else is art of medicine. And these are the lessons I've learned over the four decades I thought I should convey. Because in all this high tech, in all this uh, uh, advances that are occurring in medicine, we forget the care of patients. And this is something I tell my junior colleagues a lot, but the secret of the care of the patient is caring for the patient. Very long back, Francis Peabody, a very famous physician said this, and we tend to forget it. Because if you actually look at medicine, uh, although medicine has made advances, still there are many areas of gaps. In fact, Walter, the famous um, French philosophist used to say that the art of medicine consists in amusing the patients while nature cures the disease. This still happens in many diseases. Nature still cures many of the diseases. We just sort of have to um, be nice with the patient, tell them you're getting better and they get better. Because again, this is something which is going to be new for non-medical people. Uh, when a patient comes to us, we can make a diagnosis of what the disease is 80% of the time just by talking to the patient. Symptoms, okay, you have a cough, you have a productive cough, you have fever, so you have an infection in the lungs, so on. By examining the patient further, we can come to a diagnosis in 84% of the cases. By further investigating this patient completely, doing x-rays, CT scans and all, we can come to a diagnosis in 92% of the cases. In 8% of the cases, in spite of all the advances, we still can't, can't come to a diagnosis. And when the patient dies, when they go for post-mortem, we of course get a diagnosis in the rest of the 6%, that 98% of the patients. In 2% of the patients, in spite of all this, we still don't know the diagnosis. So this shows very clearly there's a good clinical examination and basic investigations will give us an answer in most cases. We don't require all these high techs. We require in some cases. But this is very important to realize in the care of the patients. We think that all this high technology, you know, artificial intelligence, robotics, and all is going to dramatically change uh, human medicine. No, it's not going to. Studies have shown that life expectancy depends on food, immunization, clean drinking water, sanitary facilities, and of course, education and economic empowerment. All the increase in life expectancy occurred because of this and not because of high-tech medicine. Today, if every cancer, every known cancer was cured, you know how much life expectancy will increase by just three years, only three years. So you see, it's other things that are actually making a difference. And this has been clearly demonstrated by the corona I'm talking about that in spite of so many advances is still that only isolation of the people was the one which cured this disease. And similarly, the painkiller story, this is something again, I want to emphasize to our non medical colleagues that what happens is sometimes doctors themselves also tend to overuse medicine. When we started using these painkillers called non-steroidal anti-inflammatory drugs, it produced GI bleeds. So we stopped and said, no, it's not good, don't use. We started using so-called COX-2, very selective uh, medicines for this. And everybody started using it. There was no bleed. We thought we discovered now a, a cure for pain without causing any side. But soon we discovered overviews of these medicines can give rise to heart attacks. And in many countries now, COX-2 painkillers are actually banned. They're banned now, they can't be used. So this is the story of what happens to many drugs that occur. In my opinion, the best pain reliever is the mind. The most powerful drugs in the world are two kind words from the doctors. And this is what I found. This is the art of medicine. This is not the science of medicine. Very often we are very sympathetic to the patients. We talk very nicely. You tell them you'd be better, they get better. You don't require medicines. Unfortunately, in cancer, this is amplified more. If you look at all the studies that are being done in cancer, many of them are papers that are funded by the industry and cannot be duplicated. And even very reputed uh, magazines like the Time, for example, had this thing, how to cure cancer. But when you actually look at these studies very carefully, there are very few which are really very good because one of the things that many doctors in the arrogance think is that uh, we have conquered everything. 
a wise man knows he's a fool, but a fool always thinks he's wise. This is important, remember. And this was a few years back when I was in Milan. I came across this uh, very important uh, sculpture which Michelangelo was making. This was the last sculpture he was making at 88 years old. Michelangelo, the world's greatest uh, artist, and he is unfinished and written below in Italian. I'm still learning. If Michelangelo at 88 is still learning, you can imagine what all of us are. However great a doctor is, however big he is, however famous he is, he is still learning till the end of his life. I think this is very important to remember because, uh, again, as I said, as many famous doctors, a certain amount of arrogance comes in, thinking they know everything. We don't. Still, there are many unknown facts. Of course, you become good by training, by habituation. I think excellence is mainly by working very hard. And I think this is a very famous saying from Malcolm Gladwell, which says that uh, you have to do so many hours of uh, procedures to become expert in this. And of course, our training involves seeing that the patients are very safe. And of course, uh, we can't get perfection without practice. There are two professions where it is important to be perfect before you actually get onto the plane. One is doctors and second is pilots. And look at this uh, video. This is the Air France plane which has been flown by a pilot is not properly trained still. And, um, and what happens is that, of course, uh, ultimately, unfortunately, it um, crashes. So pilots and doctors can't have learning curves. You have to be extremely careful. That's the reason why it's the duty of us teachers when we teach youngsters that to see that there are very, very few complications. But complications can occur. And this is a very famous book written by uh, Dr. Atul Gawande from the Harvard, where he talks about uh, complications in medicine. And let me read this with you, because this is very interesting. Uh, we look for medicine to be an orderly field of knowledge and procedure, but it's not. It's an imperfect science, an enterprise of constantly changing knowledge, uncertain information, valuable individual. At the same time, lives on line. There is science in what we do, yes, but also habit, intuition, and sometimes plain old guessing. The gap between what we know and what we aim for persists, and this gap complicates everything that we do. This is very important, for, especially for the, those who are not doctors there. It's important to realize that we doctors have a lot of gaps. There's gaps in science, there's gaps in practice, and there's gaps in how healthcare is delivered. And all these gaps can result in certain amount of, you can't avoid these complications. They will eventually come. Medicine is not now and has never been an exact science. Despite the exercise of greater skills, things can go wrong. When I started practice about 35 years back, patients used to come and say, tell me, doctor, I trust you. You don't have to explain, just do whatever you want. And we could, of course, wear a badge saying, trust me, I'm a doctor. It's no longer true. Patients now actually, is unfortunately, the reverse that's happened, we have so-called Google doctor, most of the patients are Googling, seeing everything, and then sometimes it becomes difficult because biology has so much variability, you can't learn from Google like physics or chemistry. Uh, this don't understand. So what is more important now is to get back the trust between doctors and patients. And this is becoming extremely important art of medicine. A few years back, uh, the then chief minister told me, can you make one of the best hospitals in the world? I'll give you so much land. And this was the land he gave to us in the present AG hospital in Gachibowli. At that time, I didn't realize that we could. I started my journey 35 years back, along with Dr. G.B. Rao, a colleague of mine who was also here. Together, we started in a very, very small way. And then to come up to this level, we had a lot of good fortune, good luck, and so on. And finally, we were able to create this hospital, uh, the AG hospitals, which is in Gachibowli, a thousand bedded hospital, which is multi speciality now. And of course, uh, we are now recognized as not only the best hospital in India, but Newsweek has given us as one of the best hospitals in, uh, in the world. Again, this is not to boast about a hospital, but just to say that in a journey, we started very small. We started thinking very small, but over a period of time, we came up uh, to a stage where uh, we started now thinking of building big things in our country also. Because I believe the success is not an accident, it's the result of an attitude. If you think you can, you can. If you think you cannot, you cannot. Either way, you're right. 35 years back, me and Dr. G.B. Rao thought you can, we can, we can, and we managed to do this. Because we realized that successful people don't do different things, they do things differently, and that's what we did. Because uh, we see people who make things happen, who watch things happen, people who wonder what happened. But the real success comes to do us, and this is where 
I believe strongly that unless you're a doer, you can't do uh, some, because we have in our, um, uh, I think in the doctor society also, there are people who say that winner has a solution for every problem and there are many losers. For every problem, every solution, they'll find a problem. And finally, I think uh, I'd like to end with what Mother Teresa once said that, hands that help are holier than the lips that pray. <laughs> We as doctors are high priests of um, the health of people. People come to us a lot of trust. In fact, can you imagine uh, any other situation and somebody can come and give your body to you, say, doctor, you do what you want, but I, I should get cured. They come with full trust. And so we are the high priests of this religion of health. And uh, it's our duty that uh, we help all our patients. And that's the reason I feel that hands that help are holier than the lips that pray. And finally, before I end, I'd like to um, talk to you about this uh, concept of glass ball and rubber ball. In fact, uh, um, some of the lessons that I learned in my life also that unfortunately as doctors, we are different from others in the sense that you can't go back at six o'clock in the evening, sit with your family, uh, have some coffee and then have dinner and talk with your children or grandchildren. Most of us in medical profession have uh, stay back very late in the night, very often misfunctions in the family. We have to sacrifice a lot. But over a period of time, you realize this concept that there's something of the glass and rubber ball. Rubber ball is your work. If you throw the ball down, it doesn't break, it bounces back. Glass ball is like your family, friends, and health. If you lose, if you throw it down, it breaks, you'll never get it. So to the youngsters now, from the experience that I've had, of course, my family, Carol is here, they made a lot of sacrifices in terms of not being able to see me for days together sometimes. My daughter used to call me the weekend father and so on. They made all the sacrifices, but it may not be with all the families. It's very important to arrive at this equation that remember the glass ball, it's family, friends, and health. Don't break it because if you break it, it'll never come back. Your work can come back because it's like a rubber ball. And finally, I told you that we, me and Jeevirao started this journey many, many years back. And you can see here many of the other colleagues that joined us. I realized that to build a world-class institution, and to build uh, an institution which can serve the society in a big way, you have to have a team. I've had, uh, I've been fortunate to have this team, a team of excellent workers, the team of scientists, clinicians, surgeons, everybody. We now have about 600 doctors in our team, all of them working very efficiently, working for a salary, doing fantastic work. And it's only because of the team that we've been able to build up this world-class institution. Again, to emphasize that whatever you are, it's a team. The credit can come to me, but it's not, it's not me. It's actually the team who has done everything and they are responsible for all this. And finally, this is my last slide. I wanted to, again, um, end with this. This is a very famous painting in 1887, painted, uh, painted by Sir Luke Field. Uh, the person you see on the bed dying, the child, the child of this uh, painter, Luke Field's painter. This child was dying because of an infectious disease in 1887. The doctor who was actually seeing this child, the country physician at that time, didn't have any scans to see what it was, didn't have blood cultures, didn't have antibiotics. The child was dying, the parents were distraught. But you look at this doctor, when you're looking at the child, the empathy he has on the child, the empathy that he's showing. The painter was so impressed, ultimately this child died, but the painter was so impressed with this doctor that he painted this to emphasize the importance of empathy. Medicine, to me, of course, a lot of advances in science. I told you about that, but the most important aspect of empathy, unless we empathize with our patient, empathy is not sympathy, not sympathizing with empathy is getting into the clothes of the patient and the relatives and see how they feel. Medicine is art, science, and empathy. Only then we become good doctors. And I think this is the most important uh, lessons that I've learned over 40 years. Again, once again, I'd like to thank um, Subbarao and uh, the society for giving me this opportunity and Mr. Jagannamon Rao and his family for giving me uh, the endowment lecture. Thank you very much. Fantastic, Nagi. I think uh, we need a moment to collect our thoughts. I think you have uh, spanned the entire gamut of humanity, science and medicine in one go and, and philosophy and art to boot. Uh, I can only say, you know, it's fantastic. And I'm not saying it because you're the distinguished speaker today or because you're my classmate, but it was 
it has it has touched every sense of all of us who have been hearing you i think and the one word which comes to my mind is candid i think very few people can be as candid as you have been this evening in this talk and i'm sure in your day to day practice i i was waiting for that word empathy you know throughout your presentation and i i thought you may not cover it but i thought i, I should mention it i'm glad you mentioned it uh, folks i if you haven't visited the new aig hospital at gachiboli i mean not as a patient but i know it's not a tourist place but i would highly recommend you go see to convince yourself that we really have a world class facility right here in hyderabad of which all of us should be proud of if you remember some uh, you know some meetings back we had dr gullapalli speak to us about uh, eye care in india and how lv prasad has become the world leader in cornea transplants and more importantly how he has elevated the standard of eye care throughout the country and that is what you're seeing dr nageshwari they do in gastroenterology and now of course all specialties i can't say this enough uh, nagi but we are so proud that one of our classmates has contributed so much to humanity i think a lot of people amongst our class guys are successful you now financially power wise you know we have all walks of life but somebody like you who has touched so many lives there are some patients here before you joined they were saying that you know you have treated in fact the chairman of the atomic energy commission mr nageshwar rao is here he was mentioning that one of his friends you you know attended to and brought him back then the chairman of ecl former chairman of ecl is here quite a number of people who you have probably touched so very very nice and i'm um, so glad that 5 months ago when we talked i invited you to mark the start of our 14th year and you have made it very special for all of us uh, there are a lot of questions but uh, let me begin by asking one how does how does a doctor like you replicate and create more mutants of yourself it is easy to have one nageshwar reddy one gullapalli nayasra one kakarla subara who are excellent embodiment of excellence but we need more of them and there are there are many other doctors also who are excellent in our country right but how do how are you I, i would even say as a national duty how are you institutionalizing your 35 40 years of experience you and dr gv rao of course i have never met gv rao but in the recent uh, hps society meeting i have read about him and i i think he comes from my brother's school ramantapur so how do you guys plan to institutionalize because treating patients is not your only national task now you have to replicate this model so that it grows across the country any thoughts any plans so subhan thank you very much for your comments um of course um, medicine unfortunately what happens in medical school is we are just taught medicine you know how to see patients how to treat them how to do surgeries or endoscopies and so on we are not taught the softer skills of managing people and this is one of the problems and when you come up in the real life you find that you can be a very good doctor but you can be bad on your soft skills and this happens to many doctors that they are excellent at their job but managing people they are not so good and that's reason why it becomes very difficult for them to build institutions i believe that uh, this is something that is confined to certain people that we'll have to train we recognize for example in our own institution me and gb we recognize who are the future potentials who can do this job somebody may not be a brilliant doctor but may be brilliant at managing people this is a different skill set completely right and the other important thing is again as you told earlier and i'd like to emphasize empathy i think um, for all human activities medicine or building institutions empathy is very important empathy with patients empathy also with employees it's very very important so you must have a person who's 
well versed in administration has empathy and who has of course a national cost look at and a combination of all this so we constantly look at uh, uh, our uh, juniors we try and see who are the ones who can potentially be groomed put them in different sections as heads of course it's not so easy as you say because it's a uh, various factors that come into play uh, in fact you mentioned uh, gn rao also I remember when gn rao was looking for his successor he put this process one year into for uh, mm. one year process and uh, he sent a group of people to our institution and told me can you assess all of these people and tell me who is going to be likely good successor so this is a process which takes long time um, hopefully at least if 10% of doctors can be good at building institutions that will serve the job yeah it's it's a, it's a tough call yes but i i wish um, aig has in its repertoire of objectives or goals or long term thing uh, to create a capsule of replicating aig practices and culture you know in, in other places uh, in the country um, i don't know if you know mateen mateen ansari yeah yeah i know actually yeah, my yeah, mother-in-law so used to be close to her yeah so she was uh, remembering and saying that you know uh, yeah, I think uh, she Shana... wants to thank her for um, having been a volunteer in Dubara. They have been yes. closely involved uh, in yes. that. Uh, well, there's one question which says, um, you know, when you mentioned about the recent heart transplant, why the pig? Why not some other animal? Is there anything? Yeah, so this is a, this is a good question. Why porcine? Uh, the reason is that um, ideal would be from primates. That is, uh, say, from baboons. In fact, one of the first early tra transplants were done from baboon also, which was done outside in a baby. It was not. The problem, of course, is ethics concern uh, because primates are very close to human beings. Most people feel that they should be treated like human beings. So you don't want to sacrifice them for uh, the transplant. So medic research in primates is very difficult now unless for example, it's a very, very important cause. Permissions are not given. And there's a feeling that they are very close to human beings, so we should not tamper. Uh, of course, with the porcine models, because people are, you know, it's part of their um, food and so on, uh, the closeness, that extent is less. Uh, so there are, of course, objections to that also. Most people don't want uh, even anything to do with any animal in terms of research or anything, but that's a different topic and different discussion. But because uh, in general, uh, this is something that can be ethically done, it's been done one. Number two is, it's extremely easy to grow large number of uh, pigs in farms yeah. to the human grade that you want. It's not so easy as other animals because they replicate very fast. Uh, it's very easy to maintain them in that. And traditionally, historically, this has been done for other organs. That's how porcine model has been taken. I see. Okay. Um, you also dealt with the technological advances and you know the newer uh, systems and uh, the interplay of technology in medicine. That you know you have shown a few slides and all. Uh, one question that comes up is affordability. Yes. Not only in a country like India. But worldwide, if you take maybe six crore or um, six billion people cannot afford this kind of uh, treatment. So do you see a role for India in driving costs down for these new technologies? And is AIG involved in any of those efforts? Yes. No, I think, again, Subhar, is a very important point that you touched that uh, medicine becomes meaningless if it can't be given to everybody. Right. If it's only for rich people, then it becomes meaningless. So we have to always think of affordable medicine. Uh, unfortunately, there is economics involved in this. If you want to get the best CT scan, the best um, surgical OTs, the best endoscope, there's some amount of money involved in that. Again, it's very unfortunate that in our country, people have to pay cash and get their medical treatment. If you go to any other country, even in, uh, I've seen in even underdeveloped countries like Sri Lanka, for example, less developed, everything is insurance plays a major part or the government makes a major part. It is, ours is one of the few countries where patient is paying out of cash 
and those who can't afford cannot pay. There are circumstances where you get patients with cancer. He has sold his house, he sold his farm, and is coming to us. His family, if he once tomorrow, if he dies, his family is on the street. It's, it's very, very pitiable. Again, as doctors, as medical professionals, something that we cannot do very much about. What we can do is to try and see if we can distribute part of medical care and see that whatever we can do, keep medical costs down and see that uh, we help these people. But you can't do only so much, you can't do that much. So this is very, very unfortunate. And the only way to solve this problem in our country would be a widespread insurance. If everybody was insured, to some extent, these government schemes are trying to do that to some extent, but if everybody was insured well, then there's no question of anybody spending uh, unnecessary money on health because health should be something which is the responsibility of the society. And this yeah. can happen only with insurance. From our hospital side, what we're trying to do is we're trying to innovate and see if we can get down the cost of some of these high-tech things to give it cheaper. For example, we have innovated a number of stents. In fact, I have a stent named after me called the Nagi stent, which uh, costs one-tenth the cost of the stents that are available in US and so on. So we have with same quality of care that give to the patient. So we're trying to do a number of these things to innovate, to get down the cost. But as I said, the cost of the basic equipment is very high. And it's, I think, ultimately the responsibility of the society to see what we can do. And again, Subara, this is a very, very important question that keeps bothering me that we yeah. sometimes get patients, poor people who have to sell everything to come and get the treatment done. And you know sometimes the treatment may not be always successful. Sometimes it's not always. A transplant may fail. So transplant means what happens to the patient family is paying 20, 30 lakhs to get a transplant done. Right. If you die tomorrow, the families on the street. So it's very, very pitiable condition. And this is something that I think we have to address over a period of time because if we don't, we are going to create a, a culture in the general population which is not going to be productive for society. It's a larger question of the society, government, policy makers, you're right. Uh, one question is about colonoscopy. Can that be replaced with the capsule that you showed on the slide yeah uh, related so, sorry uh, there's a small corollary to that yeah and uh, recently i heard that uh, everybody above the age of 50 in fact our uh, uh, rajendra reddy paul yeah yeah he was telling that uh, anybody above 55 60 years should get an annual colonoscopy done yes yes can you please so, comment on this yeah. too so in western countries especially in us and all what has happened is that after the age of 60 years, because of increased amount of polyps there, and these polyps can turn malignant cancers. Uh, the, it's advocated that uh, now the, actually the age has come down to 50 years, above that age, you must get a colonoscopy done. If a polyp is seen, we remove the polyp, they don't go into cancer. And if a polyp is seen, then again, we do what is called surveillance. Uh, so screening colonoscopy initially followed by surveillance colonoscopies, so say once in three years, depending upon the type of polyp and so on. Now, in our country, we don't do it for, of course, one is to do a screening colonoscopy in one billion population is not going to be the one. Number two, the incidence of polyps is extremely low. We have done a lot of research in this area, and we found that whereas 40% of the American population after the age of 40 years, or 50 years, 40% have polyps. So colonoscopy mm. helps to remove these polyps. Whereas in India, less than 3% have polyps. So that's the reason why we don't advocate screening colonoscope in India. Uh, capsule can replace, but capsule is extremely expensive. Colonoscopy in our country will cost about three, 4,000 rupees. Capsule will cost 40,000 rupees. Oh. So therefore, we don't encourage capsule as a screening method here. Has the capsule become almost a mainstream to affordable patients in your hospital? Yeah, for affordable patients is coming into mainstream because you just have to swallow the capsule. You get 40,000 pictures and we analyze it. 60,000 pictures we analyze. So for those who can have, again, how many people can afford 40 yeah. to 50,000 rupees you know, for a diagnostic test? That's true. Uh, Dr. Sravya wants to know, how do we regain the trust of patients in today's day and age yeah. When, um, you know, for everything, doctors are blamed, they are assaulted, hospitals are damaged. I mean, the doctor is blamed for complications, bad outcomes, cost, 
unavailability of beds, which are really outside the control of the doctor. And there are instances of some of the hospitals being vandalized like Global Trust, or Global Hospital and others. How do you as a doctor yeah. deal with these things? I think uh, Shravi, this is a very important question that the first priority among the medical profession now is to get the trust of the patient. Now, this is the most difficult aspect of practice of medicine. One of the most important things that I tell my juniors is that when a patient comes to you, even if you're a very busy doctor, it's important to remember that actually you're privileged that that patient is coming to you. When a patient comes and sees me, I feel I'm privileged that that patient is trusting me. So it's, it's important to remember that this patient has a choice. He can go to 10 different doctors, but he's come to me, which uh, is to me very important. So whatever I do for this patient, I have to do it with sincerity in terms of seeing that he doesn't waste too much money. We come to diagnosis, we give him the right form of treatment. The whole mentality should start from that, that this patient, is every patient who comes to you, comes to you with an extreme trust, which you should give it back to the patient. Unfortunately, in certain section of medical practice, either they're too busy or sometimes this factor doesn't come in when patients feel that they're being exploited. And that's when they feel that this trust goes off. And when this trust goes off, everything else becomes more difficult. Even a known complication becomes a violent act that's going to a retaliation that comes from the patient's relatives. We have never had, for example, in the last 40 years, we haven't had any patient really behaving very violently. And one of the reasons I tell, uh, tell my junior colleagues is that's because of the trust they develop. When once they have a trust on a particular doctor, then uh, this goes off. And this, the most important thing to develop in practice is trust. It becomes much more important in Indian context because in Western context, in US, for example, it's all insurance based. You don't have to, the many times the patient doesn't have trust on the doctor, it's a business. It tells the doctor, look, my insurance is paying you $400. Kindly do the colonoscopy. If something happens, they don't even fight with the doctor. There's some complication. They'll go to the court, sue for $1 million. So it's all very impersonal. Right. Whereas here, the patient is taking out his last 100 rupees and paying to you with a trust. And it's very important that we also give back the trust. And uh, it's, it's very, very clear that you can do it very easily. Uh, for example, even the way how you look at the patient in his eye, even if you're seeing him for five or 10 minutes, the sympathy or the empathy you show towards the patient is sufficient for the patient to get a trust. And this is, the trust is extremely important. Uh, very many years back, some of the family doctors in our, I remember many family doctors in our region, how they used to have trust of the whole family. Right. The family would blindly follow whatever the doctor says because of the trust that is going now with specialization and so on. Patients, the doctor, a specialized doctor may see the patient just for a few sec, few minutes. He doesn't know the family, he doesn't know the background, he doesn't have the trust and all these problems come. So trust is extremely important and this is a part of medicine that we have to develop. Very true, I can remember a couple of names readily, Dr. Jaswant Rao, Dr. Uh, Lakshman's father, yes, uh, uh, Nims uh, Teen. Uh, the cricketer Lakshman's father, VVS Lakshman's father, I forget, yes, Shantaram, Dr. Shantaram. Dr. Shantaram. Yes, yes. You know, people who really yes, take yes. time to uh, understand the family. Uh, Rekha has a question. It says, uh, she says, while, uh, so, sorry, Sravya, you were saying something? Okay. Rekha wants to know while robots do not get fatigued, like you mentioned, they still need to be operated by humans who may get fatigued, isn't it? Or is that also automated? Yeah, so there, there are a variety of levels of robotic helps that we have in medicine. There's some levels, for example, you can do a setting and say, okay, do 60 strokes of similar fashion. They'll go and do 60. Then you can just have a cup of coffee as they're doing this. So there are different levels of robots. Uh, again, Robots are still operated, but there's no independent robot. The robot is not intelligent enough to do things that the human brain does still. So there's no intelligent robot. So it has to do what we actually program it to do. But it can do long hours of mechanical procedures, which as humans, we can't do. And that's the reason why they don't get fatigued doing these procedures. 
Uh, there are a lot of other questions, Nagi, but I think they are more specific. And if you are okay with that, I can forward them to your email. Yeah, and I'll, if, I'll email if, back down. If possible, uh, yeah. Yes. But I want to end with one question. And before that, I wanted to know if Carolyn would like to speak one, in one of our meetings. Yeah, what speaker, what yeah. it means to be the wife of a, a, a devoted doctor like Nagi, you know, <laughs> we should have you also because he mentioned that in the glass ball. So it will be an interesting thing. So the last question to end this session, I, we always uh, pride ourselves on starting on time and ending on time. So we have just a couple of minutes. It is widely known that the largest spending on research or technological innovation that is being done now in the world is by technology companies like Google, Apple, uh, Amazon, and such likes. In fact, we have uh, Karthik, uh, uh, who's currently in India, as the Hari Hari Ayer's son, uh, Foswell uh, Chennai chapter, he heads the Apple Medical Facility, I think, uh, Medical Initiative. What do you think of this from a wider perspective of humanity? Is it good that healthcare innovation and research and funding is coming from technology companies and not doctors and scientists? Or is it a good thing to make it commodity so that it's more affordable while um, the skills and competence and knowledge of doctors is easily replicated and is made available to even junior doctors in remote places through use of technology, wearables, so that they take, you know, don't need, don't need blood, you don't need a needle to poke to check your sugar, such things. In the larger context of humanity, what are your thoughts? Is it a good path we are going down, or is it an, again a commercialization of medicine? So again, uh, Subhara, that's an interesting question. And I think the answer to that is that it should be a partnership, a partnership between doctors and tech companies, because tech companies themselves have a different perspective. The doctors themselves have a different perspective. The doctor by nature is very poor at innovation, is very poor at uh, uh, marketing or very poor at uh, finances. He can't, the good doctor, there are doctors who are very smart in these things also, but in general, doctors are good in clinical medicine, not good on those things. Mm -hmm. uh, the tech people are very good at innovations, financing and so on, but they may not know the human side of medicine. So when both come together with a common purpose, I think you can do wonders. Unfortunately, we are in different worlds, in uh, different buildings, and uh, we don't often come together. And to, to actually disrupt this and getting to people together in, in our institution, we have created a center of innovation. We have given space to both IIT, IIT uh, Hyderabad and to Indian Institute of Sciences Bangalore, where we work together, where we get ideas, we tell them, and then they uh, sort of actually come out with the actual the practical way of doing this. The missing link is of course, the, the financial angle which we are looking for. The, the problem, of course, is, you know, finance is the most complex thing. Anybody who wants to put in money looks at what happens in the future. There are very few true philanthropists, and hopefully we'll find some of them who would want to also take part in this. So it's going to be a triangular partnership between doctors, um, information technology engineers, and financial experts coming together. And ultimately, when they do and they think of common good of humanity, I think we can achieve a lot. And uh, of course, fortunately, this is happening in several centers all over the world. I think even the, all the so-called Googles and all are actually investing into this. And hopefully, many of these technologies are going to be affordable, which uh, ultimately, because very often the bottom line in business now is patents, how much you go get and what is your valuation and so on. All this yeah. to go off and to come towards what is good for humanity is a thought that it will take probably little time, but ultimately has to come. I think we are only time can tell where uh, this will uh, lead us. Uh, I just wanted to add uh, when the last slides that Dr. Nageshwaridi showed you of the empty land evolving into that beautiful building you see behind him. He has actually gone and he told me that he visited 
200 or so odd uh, of the best hospitals in the world over a period of time and has tried to incorporate those systems, practices, architecture, facilities, and whatnot into the uh, institution that he has built here. So there's a lot of uh, uh, blood and toil that has gone. It has not come up overnight. And the second interesting thing, I think um, he mentioned briefly now about collaboration with IITs and IIMs and also ISB, ISB also, I think you have, right? Mm -hmm. From uh, I think. ISB also you have folks, I think. So what he said is, if you can give, uh, I think in his hospital for each of the uh, consultants, senior consultants, they are supported by research associates so that they are encouraged to not only conduct research, but publish and uh, assisting them by providing the resources. These are all, you know, a way of putting into practice the philosophy that you're espousing and also walking the talk. You know, it's not easy. And I think that's where is the distinction. You know, he makes himself different. And that's what I think Hyderabad should be very proud of. Um, Nagi, it has been a fascinating, very gratifying. And um, I, I don't know if you attended, but Seshu spoke to us a few months ago on the history of pandemics. And he traced the way the pandemics, you know, over the ages, over centuries and how we dealt with it. And we had Dr. Somebody is sharing your screen. Can you please unshare Durga Prasad Garu? Please unshare your screen. Sorry about that. So it, I think it was a very beautiful uh, uh, sequel. Uh, we had Dr. Matthew Varghese, a very respected and a very uh, a guy who thinks very differently. And today we had you. And we are delighted that you marked the commencement of our 14th year of Foswell. <clears throat> we also have Ravi, Ravi Ramaswamy from Florida, our other classmate. So I think it has been a great meeting. And all good things have to come to an end. So I'd like to call our secretary, Mr. Subhas Chandra Bose, to propose a formal vote of thanks. Mr. Bose. Mr. Bose, can you please come on? Good evening. Happy Sankranti to all. Dr. <coughs> Foswell Hyderabad, Sri Venkateswara Garu, distinguished speaker, Dr. Nagesh Suraji Dubur, family and friends of Sri Jagan Mohan Roy Ethneni, ladies and gentlemen, Thank you all for joining our 157th monthly meeting, which also marks completion of 13 years of Postal Hyderabad. This is the first meeting of our 14th year. We thank the family members of Sri Jagan Mohan Rao Yatnani for establishing an annual endowment lecture in his name in the month of January. We also thank Dr. Ravi Rao Garu for the annual logistics sponsorship for the month of January every year in the name of his mother, late Mrs. U. Manorama Rao. These past two years have been the most confusing for the common man across the world. There were multiple views on various aspects of the pandemic, starting with the treatment options to what caused it in the first place. And this situation also accelerated adoption of several new practices in healthcare delivery. Today's talk gave us a glimpse of what we can expect in terms of new year practices in healthcare delivery. We also were able to get an honest understanding of the latest mutant Omicron and how we should respond. Thank you so very much, Dr. Nagesh Suradigaru, for delivering such an informative and fascinating talk in such a lucid manner. We have seen your well-known humility this evening and feel privileged 
that you could spend an evening with us in spite of your heavy busy schedule. Thank you again, and we do truly appreciate your time. Thank you, Mrs. Madhuri Nanduri, for reading the prayer and for joining us from Robbinsville, New Jersey. Thank you, Mrs. Rekha Rao Pai, for telling us about your grandmother, Mrs. U. Manorama Rao. Thank you, Dr. Savia C. Tipirneni, for introducing our distinguished speaker in such a nice manner. You are the right person to do this, being a doctor yourself. We are happy that the family members of Sri Jagan Mohan Rao Yadneni could be a part of today's meeting. Thank you, Mrs. Usha Janga, for joining us this evening from Jaipur and sharing some secrets of Sri Jagan Mohan Rao Yadneni's life and work. We propose to continue with these Zoom meetings in further notice. Omicron has cast, cast a shadow on a world that was slowly healing. This makes it all the more important to continue to follow the basic COVID protocol and getting your booster dose as soon as you are eligible. It's prudent to remain vigilant. Our forthcoming monthly meetings are as follows. Saturday, 19th February, at 6.15 p.m., Sri Mahesh M. Bhagavat, IPS Commissioner of Police, Rajakonda Commissionerate, will speak to us on the menace of human trafficking. On, on 19th March 2022, at 6.15 p.m., Dr. Jagdish Shet, Professor of Marketing, University of Emory, USA, will speak to us on the increasing central role of India in the world geostrategic order. Good night, ladies and gentlemen. We will be meet on the third Saturday of February the 19th for our 158th monthly meeting. Stay home and stay safe. Wish you all a very happy and healthier New Year 2022. Thank you all. Thank you, Mr. Bose, and uh, thank you all for attending. I think we had uh, 100 people at, uh, and I think, I don't know how many were on YouTube. Thank you again, uh, Dr. Nageshwar Reddy. It was a delight to have you and uh, see you in this role. Good night. I'll now close the meeting.